Welcome to the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast, where we hope to inspire you to embrace your God-given gifts, skills, and passions in order to lead with confidence. We want you to remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, and you are fully loved by Him. You have been designed on purpose by God with unique gifts and passions in order to love and lead those around you. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, a pastor's wife, business owner, mom, and writer. And I'm Esther's co-host, Holly Kane. I'm a wife, mom, and business owner. I also write at hollycane.org, where I focus on my passion for women's ministry. Together, we chat about important issues that Christian women leaders face. In addition, we interview other women just like you who lead in various roles from church to community to business. Through this podcast, we offer you encouragement, tools, and resources to help you on your leadership journey. We are so glad you're here with us. Hey, friend, and welcome to episode 185 of the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, and I am so glad to have you here with me as we kick off 2022. Have you ever sensed God calling you to something that you didn't want? Maybe He's spoken to you about something and you think, nope, that's not for me, God. Well, my guest today felt that way too, and I know you're going to love hearing her journey of stepping into a new season and a new phase of her calling. Today, I'm chatting with Alyssa Circle. She's a lifestyle blogger and founder of the Pollinate Media Group, and in recent years, God began to shift her heart, instilling a desire to help Christian women grow closer to Jesus. Through her blog and social media, She began shifting her content to serve women for kingdom impact. Over the years, she had helped a lot of businesses make their voice heard, and now she's using the voice God gave her to help women find faith and freedom. I met Alyssa at the Clarity to Courage conference and got to chat with her quite a bit, and I loved hearing her journey. And so I invited her on to the podcast because I knew it would encourage you as well. I think you're going to love what Alyssa shares about learning to surrender her business to God, how we should approach working alongside other Christian women, even if they're doing something similar to us, which we all know can be a challenge. And I also love how Alyssa views parenting teens. It's a perspective you don't hear often. So you're going to love this conversation that I had with Alyssa. A couple quick notes before we dive in. First, if you missed the last episode of 2021, episode 184, Holly and I wrapped up the year and we shared some updates about the podcast. So in case you missed it, one of the things we shared was that there is a change happening moving forward. And you might have noticed that we didn't have an episode go out last week. And moving forward, this podcast is not going to have an episode every single week, at least not for right now. So currently, the plan is to have an episode go out twice a month, and one of those episodes will be an interview, and the other one will probably be either me or Holly solo or the two of us together. And so we want to keep staying in touch with you. We want to keep providing this content to you. It's just not going to be quite at the same pace as it has been for the past three and a half years. So what we hope you will do is stay subscribed, share the podcast with a friend, of course, but also if you have missed some of the past episodes on the off weeks, we encourage you to go back and listen to something that you might've missed in the past. All right, now today's episode is brought to you by my Ideal Biz Bootcamp, which is coming up next week if you're listening to this in real time. If you want to use your God-given gifts, skills, and experiences to make an impact and grow a business, if you're tired of feeling confused about how to take what you already know, what you have experience in, what you really wanna do in this world and create a business you love, if you're sick of trying to follow someone else's plan or model or, you know, start a course or all these things that people tell you what to do only to get nowhere and see results that don't compare (laughs) in the slightest to what they promised, then this is for you. And best of all, for right now in this live version happening in January 2022, it will be completely free to participate. So head over to idealbizbootcamp.com to grab your spot today. All right, let's go ahead and dive into our conversation with Alyssa Circle. 
All right. Well, welcome, Alyssa, to the podcast. I am excited to be talking with you today. And to get us started, could you just share a little bit about yourself and what your life and leadership looks like right now? Sure. Well, thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Podcasting is new to me. So if I trip over my words, you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> so just a little bit about me and my leadership journey. I went to school to be a teacher. So I think it's always been leading and guiding people. Teaching people has always been an innate part of how God created me. I knew from the time I walked out of my fifth grade classroom that Mrs. Thompson had changed my life and that I forever wanted to be some kind of teacher. At the time, I thought I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. So I have a teaching credential and a master's degree in education, which got put to good use until we had children. And then we weighed out the cost of childcare versus the cost of me staying home. And basically it was an even playing field. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I feel like that was probably the first time God really started shifting the direction of my life. And so I really didn't know how teaching was going to be involved in that or how I was going to continue doing that. But I just knew, or my husband, and I just knew that we were supposed to that I was supposed to stay home. So yeah. I've been married for 17 years this year. We have two teenage kids. Our daughter just turned 13 this summer and our son turned 12 in November. And so we are living fully into the preteen and teen years, which I yeah. think are my favorite. I love them <laughs> so much. They're just, I don't know. The kids are, they're so much more vivacious and we can have so many more deeper conversations than I feel yeah. like we ever could before. And they see life in this, new way and they teach me so much, which is yeah. I'm thankful for. But my journey in teaching began just teaching them and guiding them. And then I fell into the blogging space in 2007. So I'm, I would consider myself an OG in the blogging space. Right. I started blogging because I really just wanted, I'm not a scrapbooker. So <laughs> I wanted to be able to document our life and our journey and do it in a way that was virtual so that our family, my family's all over the place, that they could pop on the blog and see updates about what was going on in our lives. I opened an Etsy shop and I was, I taught myself how to sew. I thought I was going to sew every single one of my daughter's dresses. That did not happen. <laughs> but I did have an Etsy shop for a little while where I was sewing and creating, but just really fell in love with the blogging space. And that led to connecting with some brands. So back in 2010, it was kind of the wild, wild west of blogging and brands were really realizing the value of using online mom bloggers to amplify their story. Here are these women that are all talking to each other online, going to each other for advice, documenting this advice online. And they were like, wow, if people are going to learn how to change a diaper or what's the best formula or what bottle is the best bottle on the market, imagine what they could do for all of our products and services. And so brands began reaching out to mom bloggers, myself included. Cost Plus World Market was my first client. They reached out to me. I was working with them. And then they asked me to build an, a brand ambassador program for them. And I thought, you know what? If I'm doing this and I'm making money being able to stay at home and take care of the kids, I have so many other friends that are trying to do the same thing, stay at right. home, but make an income. What if I could bring them on board and create a company where brands can come to us and we can create content for them? And so that was really how Colony Media was born in 2010. And I owe it really all to my husband. I always say I'm an accidental entrepreneur. He is completely <laughs> a serial entrepreneur. So he was like, Alyssa, like you have all these friends, like you're all trying to do the same thing. You have all these, we have all these contacts. Like, like how can we merge this world? And so that really gave us a platform, a new platform where it gave me the opportunity to not only lead other women, teach other people in the field, but also to empower women to have more of a, an opportunity to make money while staying home and taking care of their kids and really be able to make money while doing something that they were really good at. 
Yeah. And we're already creating, a lot of them were already creating this type of content on their blogs. Now they were just getting paid to do it. And so Pollinate was formed over the years. I was I had the privilege of speaking at many conferences about social media and blogging and how to work with brands. And that brings us basically to today, which is crazy. The landscape <laughs> looks a little bit different yeah. than, um, since 2020 than it did before 2020. But mm. It's just been such an incredible journey. And over that time, I've just discovered that women are just so beautiful and so creative. And it's really fun to bring opportunities for them to be able to do that, to just live into their gifts Mm -hmm. and be able to financially support families. I have friends that literally make a full-time income now just working with in brand partnerships. Wow. I love that. Thank you for sharing that backstory. It's super fun to hear the full story because I heard it like parts of it when we met at Clarity and Courage, but now just hearing it all in one in one little snippet is cool. And I want to just go back to one thing you said, which is not necessarily related to the leadership journey, but what you said about your kids and the the fact that you're enjoying the teen years. I think somebody today needed to hear that because so much of what we hear about the teen years with parenting is like, oh, I hope you survive. You'll have to just grin and bear it, like all this stuff that's negative around the teen years. So it's fun to hear that you're enjoying it and that you love that phase. And I think for my daughter, it's fun just each phase of her childhood and and now going into the teen years too. It's like, it's a new adventure every time we <laughs> she gets older. So I, thank you for sharing that. So going back, I would love to have you share a little bit of maybe the challenges or some of the bumps they wrote, because what you just shared made it sound like, well, that was super easy and fun that you just went from blogging to making money blogging to having sponsorships and partnerships and then starting a company. (laughs) But I'm guessing there wasn't, it wasn't like necessarily smooth sailing the whole time. So could you share any of maybe the challenges that you had to overcome as you grew into these different stages of that journey? Yeah, I would like to, I should apologize for painting it as, a beautiful, like easygoing (laughs) journey. I think mostly when you're trying to give a quick introduction, it comes off that way. But there, like you said, there's so many words in between the lines that you don't really see or you you don't get to kind of glimpse behind the curtain of challenges that happened along the way. I think the biggest thing was overcoming like my own personal hurdles. Mm -hmm. One, as I was saying earlier, that I felt like I was an accidental entrepreneur. That was my mindset was like, I fell into this. I wasn't created for this. I wasn't made for this. I'm not capable of this. And I'm completely faking it till I make it. Right. And so I I second guessed a lot of my decisions in those first several years, probably throughout the course of the company. There were times, you know, where I I really needed a sounding board and I was thankful to have an executive coach and then also have a sounding board in my husband who's really incredible and a wonderful problem solver and but also can speak a lot of encouragement into me Mm. and remind me, he reminded me of my capability in overcoming a lot of these hurdles. But it was first and foremost was really myself. Like, can I do this? Am I capable of doing this? Who am I to be, <laughs> get, you know, to be building this company? And then really learning how to secondarily hire a team, create a team, create a company culture, and empower the people on my team. I am not a hover parent. So I did not like the idea of being a hover boss. And I did not want to hire anyone who wanted to be a hover boss either. Yeah. So I think the second challenge really over the years was how do we maintain this company culture where people feel like they can come to me with anything, their ideas are always welcome. And they were because as the company progressed over the years, what seemed like these 30 steps were the best way to get from point A to point B. If we could figure out how to do it in 15 with the same efficiency as the 30, then like that's what we needed to do. And I was always open to ideas for how to do that. I really believed that 
in order to create a really strong company culture, your team needs to be a stakeholder in your business. So while everyone might have a title or there might be certain chains of command, essentially we were all one team. And I would always tell our team, we're all in a boat, we're all in a rowboat, and we all need to like row together. And if we don't row together and we don't row in sync, then we all row in circles together and go nowhere. <laughs> right. So I think those were probably my biggest two things and how I grew as a leader over the years. I think leadership has probably always been something that's an innate gift in me, but knowing that and walking it out are two different things. And I think so often we know we have these gifts. We take tests that show us that we have these gifts. We see other people call out these gifts in us. And then we fail to see through our own insecurities and hurdles, like how we actually can live into those gifts. And right. so learning how to overcome those and how to walk through those only serves to make us better leaders over time. Yeah, so true. And I think what you were sharing earlier about just those mindset questions of, am I actually meant to do this? You know, who am I to do that? That's something that so many who are listening to this podcast can, I'm sure, relate to. I've thought those things many times. Having a podcast, like who am I to do this podcast, right? So what are some of the things that you did to overcome that, to get past some of those thoughts and those questions of maybe insecurity or just lack of actually believing that you are called to do what you're called to do? I I hired an executive coach in the early years. She was extremely pivotal in helping me really move beyond some of the hurdles that I had felt like I had come up against and really focus in on all of my strengths, helped me create boundaries. So part of also another issue I had was that I couldn't turn it off. Like I would be literally 24 seven thinking about the business, thinking about how we could grow the business, thinking about, you know, stressing, anxiety, like all of the things. And I had no balance. Like it would be 11 o'clock at night and, and I would just be downloading ideas to Kyle. Like, well, what about this for our company? And what about that? And, and there was really no space to just like breathe and be me. So she really helped me create some balance. And as I created balance in my life and I wasn't perfect at it, I, I think that they're really, it's really difficult to have work-life balance. But as I started to learn how to take time out and do things for myself, I think that it allowed me to stop being in my business and focus on my business. Yeah. And that changed also that really shifted me as a leader and how I led my team moving yeah. forward beyond yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. That's so good. I love that. So I am curious, Alyssa, what role faith has played in this journey? You shared a little bit about that with me at Clarity to Courage. So I'd love if you could share a little bit about what that has meant in this whole journey of your business and your leadership. Well, I think that the Lord, I mean, it can see his fingerprints over everything in my whole life. But even in how the business was set up, the doors that he opened for our clients, the doors he opened for my team. I had the most incredible team. There is not one person that worked for me over the years that didn't bring so much strength and greatness mm -hmm. to pollinate as it formed as a company. I'm like so grateful for all of them. It's been so fun to see how they've all gone out and created other successful businesses for themselves. So knowing that God's had like so many fingerprints over the people, over the clients, I, there's been so much favor in our business over the years. And we've also had, he's opened so many doors for the business in terms of success to enable us to really give back to faith-based organizations that we really love throughout the years. Now, as I was sharing with you, Clarity to Courage, 
he has just really started to shift what is going on in me and in our business. Starting in 2019, he really began to shift my heart towards really diving into his word more and teaching women about having a deeper relationship with him, which seemed to come out of left field. I've always been a believer. I've always been involved in Bible studies that other people are leading. I've always been in the word, but I, there was like this shift that I felt like he started saying was coming and he was, he was like, the wind is changing and I want you to be ready for it. And I was kind of like, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's cool. Like I'm going to keep doing my thing we've got a good thing going. So I'm just going to read my Bible more, but let's keep this like good thing, (laughs) this good thing going. Right. And little did I know was that God was like preparing my heart because 2020 was going to happen. And like everyone else, I'm sure you've seen this like shift in your business where we've had to find ways to pivot, to be flexible, to do things differently, to kind of take the systems we already created and create new systems. So I think that that's where really, like I started to encounter God and he really started to shift my heart for what was to come, even though I had no idea what it was. And so when 2020 hit and you couldn't get anything on store shelves anymore. So now I have a business where brands come to me we put together these whole programs with influencers where they go in store, purchase a product, come home, create evergreen content around it, and then post it online. And suddenly it's like, you can't even buy popcorn at the store. <laughs> like you can't right. get canned food, even if you wanted to. So forget healthy foods or vitamins or bacon for crying out loud. Like there was just nothing. It was like the apocalypse happened, right? Yeah. Last. March and April, as and rightly so. Everybody had no idea what was going on. It was something unprecedented. I hate that word, but yeah. we just yeah. it was we were dealing with something that we had never dealt with as well as the entire world before. Yeah. It was in that moment that I was like, okay, Lord, like this is why you've been whispering in my ear for the last eight months. Like you've been preparing me for a shifting landscape in my business. As I look back, I was seeing how he was asking me things like, would you be willing to sacrifice this if I asked you to? Would you be willing to walk away from this if I asked you to? Would you be willing to shift your entire business and recreate it, meaning do the work to shift things up? What are you willing to let go and give me control of? Because I knew God had given us that business. His fingerprints were all over it. But over the years, I had taken what he had given me and I had run with it and taken it on as my own. All the problems were mine to solve. I had lost track of keeping him involved in the conversation of of repeatedly giving him back and my business. Slowly but surely, he'd been asking me all of those questions. And I think it was to lead up to that moment where it was like, now I'm literally looking face like head on it, am I going to lose my business? How am I supposed to support my team? They all have families. They, They all have bills to pay. What about all of our influencers? Like they have families, they have bills to pay. How are we going to support them? You know, how are we going to pay our own bills? And it really, I think in that moment, completely changed again my relationship with Jesus. And I began to let go of things and hand them over to him because I knew that I only had them to begin with because he gave them to me. And so now here we are in, in 2021 and we've had to shift like how we do things that pollinate. We've had to adapt and be flexible and be okay with, with business slowly ramping up again and some days not and some days yes and we just have to be okay with that because God has provided and he has provided for like other opportunities for different members of my team so that they had you know they were able to supplement income during that time and 
I don't know. I just feel like he, he's really doing a work in me. Yeah. To really test and say like, how much of your leading is about you, Alyssa, and how much of your leading is about what I'm calling you into? Hmm. That's a, a powerful question, I think, for anyone to ask. And I think it's completely normal for that to happen. Like what you just said, like whether it's a business or whether it's a church leadership role or whether it's you you made it to the top of your company, whatever it is, you know at the beginning that that is from God, but then along the way, it's like, yeah, I did pretty good at that. You know, I got myself to that point and you kind of forget that that actually was all God. So it's beautiful to hear you share, you know, how God has worked and how he has led you. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts, because I think this is a challenge that a lot of women face is they sense God shifting them into something. They sense God leading them in a direction. And sometimes the direction doesn't make any sense at all. Right. Like you said, when he first started talking to you about like, you know, start thinking about getting closer to me and start thinking about other women and, and supporting women. Why do you think we don't follow that sometimes? Or why do you think we resist that, that leading or that guiding from him? I think once we, we take over control of what God has given us, then shifting is difficult because we don't trust that if we hand it back to him, (laughs) that it's all going to go as successfully as we feel like we've managed to take it. Yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense. I, I've i been studying Genesis. I'm in a Bible study and we've been talking about Hagar, but in the, the midst of this Bible study, we've also been talking about Abraham and Isaac. And when you look at Abraham, he just like always went wherever God told him to go. Mm-hmm. God would be like, Abraham, and he'd be like, here I am, Lord. And and God would literally say, pack up everything and go this way. And I'll just tell you when you're done walking this way. And he would, he packed up everything and he just did that. And then when God asked him to sacrifice Isaac, he did that because he had full faith that either God was going to provide an additional, like a different animal to sacrifice. Or more importantly, that he just knew that God had the power to raise Isaac from the dead. So his faith was just so incredible. And then I look at Lot, whose faith was sort of there, but he had been living kind of in this, in Sodom and Gomorrah, where everything was a little bit more self, well, a lot more self-centered, let's just say. (laughs) And when God rescued Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, Sarah, or not Sarah, I'm sorry, Lot's wife, Mm -hmm. she looks back. Yeah. And as I've been reading this, this is all going to come together. But as I've been reading about this, I feel like the Lord is like just trying to tell us, are you going to be like Lot's wife? Where you're always looking backwards at, well, this is what worked before. This is what's made me successful. This is what I've been doing. This is what I want to continue to do because I know it's working. Or when he starts to put that shift on our heart, are we going to stay looking forward? And are we going to say, okay, I am going to go in the direction you're telling me to go. And I'm going to dig wells and I'm going to worship as I go, because I know that where you're taking me is so much better than where I'm at. Yeah. And it's like, can we, do we have the ability to go and relinquish control of that aspect of our life? And if we can't, we need to look at whether or not it's become an idol in our life yeah. and figure out if that's, you know, like, what is it? What's the stumbling block to being able to move past giving God back control of your business? Because he is going to, he's going to make you a better leader than you're going to make yourself. He is going to grow your business better than you are going to grow your business because God can see the shifting landscape in ways that you can't see. And so if he is whispering to you that, that he's trying to pivot you or shift you or mold you into a new direction, we may not understand what that looks like, but he's probably preparing us for something that we couldn't see. 
Like when I look back and I see how he was saying, like, will you still trust me even if I change the landscape of your business? Will you still trust me if you're not running 14 campaigns a month and you're running, you know, one or two in this season? Will you still trust me the same way? to provide for you? Or are you going to think that like, well, I need to do something and I'm in control of this and I, I don't have that kind of trust. Yeah. Yeah. So much of my leadership journey is about surrender and letting go of control. (laughs) And it's exactly what you are talking about right now. It's just like saying to God, all right, I'm going to stop trying to white knuckle it and keep a handle on it because actually, I don't actually have any control, even if I think I do. So it's so good. All right, Alyssa. So one of the things that you mentioned as we started this conversation is your passion for, you know, empowering women. And also you mentioned the teaching aspect and and some of that. So how is that playing out in your life now? Is there anything that you're doing along those lines that you're living out at this time in your leadership? I think that as God has really shifted just what he has put on my heart, it has put me in rooms and opened up doors that that I never really saw myself opening or, or walking in. Clarity to Courage was one of them. Never in my life did I think that I would teach a room full of women about the Bible and about what God says about women supporting women and collaborating with one another teaching on a stage over the years about social media or business or what's worked to grow my team those are so much easier but actually to like dive into the word because in my mind helping women know God deeper is a big calling yeah and one that I will say like completely intimidates me, but then it reminds me that like, I'm really not doing this in my own strength. Like this is, that's when you know, you're kind of walking in what God has for you. Yeah. But I've just always really loved the idea of being able to cheer on other women in our lives, whether we're close to them or we're not super close to them. Like when Jesus came to earth, there's so many stories in the Bible of in the old and the new Testament, actually where God elevates women in society. So, So society had like kind of placed women lower on the totem pole, let's just call it. But he, he really shifts that perspective and we begin to see women like Deborah, who was the first judge. And then you see Esther, who had so much favor with the king and saved the Israelites. And then you see the woman at the well who comes just completely broken and leaves having encountered God in a new way and goes off and starts basically preaching to everyone. And all these people come to know Jesus (laughs) because of her. And I'm like, if Jesus came to do that, if that was part of his plan and we want to emulate Jesus, which is what as believers we're supposed to do. We are supposed to walk in Jesus's footsteps. And if this is what Jesus did, then this is what we are called to do too, for each other, Mm -hmm. which means that it doesn't matter how God is working or, or how quick or slow we feel like he's moving in our own calling, our own journey, that should not hinder us from cheering on the other women in our lives who might be at a different point in their journey. Yeah, And I think that in that, he has really shifted my focus into that. It's like, how can I encourage women to love Jesus more and out of their love for Jesus and wanting to have this intimate relationship with Jesus, emulate him more and then serve him by serving other women that they know and calling out their leadership qualities, their gifts, their talents, and really seeing women. And when we see how God sees us and we know how he thinks about us and and what he says about us, then we are able to do that for other women as well. And so that's really, I feel like he's really put that on my heart. And that's, I don't know what that looks like mm-hmm. entirely, but mm-hmm. I 
right now I just say I'm just walking in obedience that he's going to open the doors that are supposed to be open, the opportunities that are supposed to come. And in the meantime, I'm just going to keep sitting at his feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So I would love to ask you a couple questions about that, about this idea of encouraging other women and collaborating and, and that, because I know you spoke about that at Clarity to Courage and I didn't get to attend your sessions because I had the same sessions when I was speaking too. So now I just got to ask you about it. One of the things that I see happen for some of the women in my community is they sense God calling them to do something. And then they look around and they think that everybody else is doing that thing. And so then they shrink back and they don't step into that calling. So that's like one way that it happens. The other thing that happens is they sense God calling them to do something. They see other women doing it. And then they get that feeling of like angst or like jealousy or like, why is she so much further ahead of me? Or why can't I get that speaking gig or those kinds of things? So could you speak to kind of those two scenarios and maybe how we can respond differently to that situation? Sure. So one of the things that I talked about at Clarity to Courage is that when God gives us a calling or he puts something on our heart, it doesn't mean that that timing is for right now. It may mean that there is going to be a season where he is going to have to spend some time preparing your heart, preparing your mind, and really just every part of you for that calling. When he began talking to me about these shifts in 2019, I was literally like, no, absolutely not. I'm not interested in doing that. It's not for me. I could think of so many other women who would be so much better at this than me. But the first opportunity that he gave me, the first open door he gave me to actually speak to a room of women about Jesus was October of 2021. So now we're looking at a whole almost 18 months after he started talking to me. And there were so many things that I had to work through in order to be ready. So many things that I saw in myself, some jealousy, comparison, offense. Like there were so many things that I had to work through. And so I think when God's calling us into something, first and foremost, we need to trust that if he's calling us into it, he's given us that promise that he knows the timing better than we do. And if it's not happening right away, we need to start asking him, what is it that you need to work on in me so that I can be ready when you're ready? Yeah. And then help me be patient as I'm waiting and show me how I can be a good supporter of other people who are at a different place in their journey than me so that you're working through a lot of those feelings. If you think that if you're jealous now or you're envious now or you're comparing yourself now to other people, women and other people that might be further along, then when God starts opening those doors for you, if you haven't dealt with that stuff before he starts using you, you're going to still be dealing with that stuff. And it is going to, it'll end up taking precedence in your ministry over the ministry itself. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, not that we're never going to deal with those feelings. I'm sure those feelings will come up, but it's like, we've got to get to the root of the issue and deal with whatever it is that God wants to work in us to prepare us for the calling. We want the calling, but we don't want to do the work to get there. And so my encouragement is, is if God's called you into something, he's not going to change that. He's called you into it. He's given you the gifts to do it. Be willing to sit at his feet until his timing is right, because he's going to be more capable of swinging those doors wide open for you than you are trying to go out and make all of those opportunities happen for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then as you're dealing secondarily with feelings of inadequacy or comparison, remember that sometimes God, actually oftentimes God puts on the hearts of many people, whatever it is he's trying to tell the vast majority of people. So one of the examples that I gave at Clarity to Courage was when I first met, Kara, who was speaking at Clarity to Courage, and Samantha, who also was speaking. We were all like, God had just literally told me, I want you to create an Instagram called Called to Abundance. I had no idea what he was going to do with it, but he talked to me about it. He showed me like literally the website's open, the Instagram's open. So I just, I literally 
grabbed all of it. Then I meet Kara, who was at the time Abundance Mama. And then God put on Sam's heart, Abundant Woman, after she went to Avery's first retreat. And suddenly I have these women that are incredible women that God's put in my life. And we're all talking about (laughs) abundance. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and it would have been really easy. And I'm not going to lie. We did have the conversation where it's like, well, gosh, guys, like we're all doing the same thing. Like, well, what does yours look like? Well, what does yours look like? And I'm kind of intimidated by this. And and it would have been really easy for us to be like, maybe like we were wrong about this friendship. But we didn't because we were like, maybe God put all of this on our hearts because the three of us combined still couldn't reach the 350 million people that live in the United States. So gosh, I hope he put it on our hearts and the hearts of so many other women to also be talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why God puts the same, I guess the same like purpose Mm -hmm. on many of our hearts is because it's something that he knows his people need and he needs as many people to get it done as possible. If we only needed one disciple in order to go on and tell the entire world about Jesus, like Jesus would have only had one disciple and he would have trained up that one disciple. And then they would have talked to the crowd and let the crowd do the rest of it. But he had 12 disciples. And even when he sent the 12 disciples out, he told them to go not alone, but together. And they traveled Mm -hmm. two by two. Yeah. Why? So that when one was preaching, the other was praying. And I think that that's how we are called to work together as women so that when one of us is leaning into our calling and and living into it fully, the other person can be praying and declaring over them. And there's going to be seasons where it's going to be give and take, but we have the opportunity to be able to pray God's calling into other people's lives and then watch them live it out and know that we were part of interceding for that. Yeah. I love that. And I love that you gave that practical example with you and Kara and Sam, because I can't remember if I put it on the podcast or just wrote about it in an email or something, but I was talking about at Clarity to Courage, you know, meeting several women who are doing the same thing. Like (laughs) I talked to several who are like, I help women learn how to study the Bible. And it would be so easy, like you're saying to say, well, wait a minute if God's using her, then maybe I shouldn't do this because she's already doing it. I don't want to take over what she's doing, that kind of thing. But God can use all of us and we all will do it with a slightly different approach, right? Like you and Kara and and Sam are probably talking about this theme of abundance in different ways. And that's the other thing that I try to remind myself and other women is it's not going to look the same, even if you on the outside, on the surface level, it kind of sounds the same. It's most likely going to play out very differently because of your unique gifting and calling and experiences and and personality and all of that. Exactly. Exactly. We all have grown up uniquely from each other. And so our stories are going to be different. But that's the beauty of it is that when Jesus is trying to reach people and he knows that He created us to want to be in connection with one another and relationship with one another. But one of the things that we always look for is like, well, could that person really understand me? Does that woman really know what I've gone through? And so I believe that he needs a majority of us who all have the same passion to reach those women, to be able to open doors where it's like us or you're going to go in and you're going to go speak into this room of women. And the women in this room need to know that you have been through what they've been through, that you understand what they're going through, that you've lived through it. And and you're going to know that you're going to speak into their lives because God put you in that room. And he put the women that need to hear your story in that room so that he can use you to strengthen their faith. Yeah. The other trap that I think women fall into, especially like what you were talking about when God is whispering on your heart to step into something new or to do some form of leadership in some way. And, you know, it took 18 months to get to that point where you were doing it. But in the meantime, I think sometimes we overlook the daily 
faithfulness of just doing what we're called to do in that moment and also serving the two or three people in our home or the small group at church or those quote unquote small things. Right. And mm-hmm. it's it's easy to say, well, I want to speak. God has called me to speak on stage and I want to speak in front of 500 people or 5,000 people. But what if he wants you to start by just <laughs> speaking to those four women at church? And it's easy to overlook or think that that's not an important part of the journey, but it's certainly been a huge part of my journey of just those small things being faithful there before God. Like you said, it's part of the preparation of actually being ready to step into the next phase that he's calling you to. Yeah. If you're not willing to step into the little things, then why would he trust us with the bigger things? We need to know what it looks like. We need to, on a smaller scale, like what good is it if God were to stick me on a stage with 10,000 women, if my own daughter doesn't know who she is or what God says about her, because I'm so busy pouring into other people that I'm not pouring into her. I want Caitlin being 13 years old to know exactly who she is in Jesus. I want to speak that into her because it doesn't matter how 10,000 other women feel. If my own daughter at home doesn't know who Jesus is and I'm not reflecting him to her, then I'm not, I'm not doing the work in the small things. Like you just said, in those 18 months, I found myself just saying, okay, God, like you're, you're confirming what you're going to do in my life through several highly trusted praying people, but I don't know what it's going to look like. So in the meantime, I'm just going to keep doing Bible studies, keep digging into the word. And so I was, I was actually telling some friends yesterday that I'm just getting in the habit of writing every day. You know, it may end up being a chapter in my book that I'm writing and it may end up being in a future book. It may be a blog post It it may end up on someone's podcast. You may end up on Instagram. But in order to be able to speak about Jesus to others, I need to know not only what the Bible says, what he's, what he wants to say through me to others. And so it's practicing that. It's like being willing to go on Instagram live and have a conversation about the Bible and what the Bible says about identity or purpose or calling where it's being willing to serve in church as a small group leader, or sometimes it's simple. It's as simple as just being like tonight, we're going to church and we're serving pizza before the Wednesday night service. And we do it the first Wednesday of every month. And it just gives me a chance to like love on people by, you know, through handing them slices of pizza. And sometimes that's what God's calling on our life looks like is by simply being willing to serve in whatever capacity, because Jesus came to serve, not to be served. So if we're going to live into our calling, it needs to be first that we understand that our calling involves serving other people. And if we're not willing to serve other people and we're only willing to serve ourselves and what we want and have it packaged the way we think it should be packaged, then we're coming from the wrong motives and we need to check that and change it. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, wow. That's a great mic drop to kind of wrap up our conversation with. I love that, Alyssa. I want to just wrap up with a couple questions that we always try to ask our guests at the end. So we like to say here on the podcast, leaders are learners. And so we always like to hear from our guests something that you are learning lately. It might be a book you've read or a podcast you've listened to, or just something God is teaching you that you would want to share with our audience. I probably gave a sneak peek into that earlier, but one of the things that the Lord is really teaching me right now is not to keep looking backwards. It's so easy for me to look back and be like, can everything look like it did? Can it all come together like it felt like it was together before? Yeah. And I was telling my husband this the other night that I feel like the Lord is just asking me to sacrifice things that have held high importance to me and showing me places where I have put, where I live, communities that I'm a part of, businesses that we've had ahead of where God may want to take me. Because I think that I have a better idea of how and in one environment I'm going to thrive in. And so 
every morning he basically will ask me, Alyssa, are you going to be like Lot's wife today? And every morning I'm like, no, I'm not. Mm. And it may seem so small, but it feels so big because it's so easy to look at what was once happening whatever it was in your life. Like, it's just so easy to look backwards and to be like, but it used to look like this or it used to be like this. And I feel like that hinders us from what God wants to do. And I think that he is calling us to look up and look forward and focus on him. And he's really in the last 18 months, especially been really working with me in my heart about things that I put before him. Mm-hmm. So I think for me, the biggest thing that I've been working on is what areas of my life am I putting before you? And what do I need to surrender, sacrifice, stop looking back on yeah. so that you can use me right now, today, how mm-hmm. you want to use me? Like, Help me show up in conversations. Like if I'm supposed to be at the grocery store, maybe it's to have a conversation with someone at the grocery store. Maybe it's today I'm just supposed to snuggle with my son on the couch and speak words of life into him of what he's good at and where his strengths are and what God's doing in him. And being okay with that and not constantly feeling like if I didn't, do X, Y, and Z, then I wasn't successful today. Mm. Oh, so good. (laughs) I feel like we could just keep going here, but we got to wrap it up. So Alyssa, I'm sure that people are going to want to connect with you, maybe follow you, find out more about what you are up to. So where is the best place for people to connect with you? And uh, we'll make sure these links and things go in the show notes as well. So I'm on Instagram a lot. So you can find me over on Instagram. And over on my blog, my blog is called Little Bit City, Little Bit Country. We split time between Southern California and Franklin, Tennessee. So we we like to say (laughs) we love the city and we love the country. And (laughs) the blog is a byproduct of that. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. That's so awesome. Well, I just want to thank you for sharing your journey, sharing the lessons that God has been teaching you and the encouragement for women to be lifting one another up. I think you shared so many good insights today and I just appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider leaving us a rating and review in your podcast app? This helps more women just like you find the podcast and it also helps them to know whether the podcast would be a good fit for them. Just go to the show in your podcast app, then scroll down until you see the option for ratings and reviews. From there, you can tap to rate and write a review. It means the world to us when you take a couple minutes to do this. And thank you so much to everyone who has left a review. Now, don't forget, your leadership matters, and it's time for you to embrace your gifts and lead with confidence.